Heavenly Father, I uh, thank you so much for your word, and I thank you that you speak to us through it. I pray that this morning you would help us to uh, have clear minds and clear hearts that are free from uh, distractions around us or our lack of sleep overnight. Uh, Lord, please help us to understand what you have to say to us in this part of your word. And if we already know Jesus, help us to love him even more because of what uh, we're about to consider. And if we don't know Jesus, please help us to see the change that he can make in our lives and help us to uh, come to a saving knowledge and understanding of what Jesus has done for us. We pray and ask for this in his name. Amen. Amen. Growing up, I had a whole bunch of different hairstyles. The one that I'm probably the most embarrassed about is the one that's about to come up on the screen. This is... Um, <laughs> that's the wrong order, just quietly. But um, yes, that's the one that I was most embarrassed about. I think my mum was hoping when I was a kid uh, that I would never get a girlfriend. And so she decided that she'd just give me like a comb over. And so here's me and my friend Dan Peters. Dan's got a nice shaved head. And my mum thought, I know, I'll comb Mitch's hair over and um, make sure that he's single forever. <laughs> anyway, as I grew up, I decided that um, that wasn't for me. And so the next one is um, my haircut that I decided to get when I was in year 12. Now it's a bit dark up there, but I decided to shave all the top of my head off and just have a nice filthy mullet at the back here. And it was about that time that I actually did get a girlfriend. Um, now that was a change, but not long after that, I was like, oh, the mullet's probably not giving me a heaps good reputation, so I'm going to change it again. And I went for this. <laughs> yeah, the long curly red hair. And now I thought this was a really good change, and then I got asked to be the clown on the happy day at McDonald's. And I was like, oh, that's not really the vibe I'm going for with this haircut, so maybe it's time for another change. And so I got rid of that, and I ended up with what I have today. Shame I still can't smile though. Um, so there's a whole range of changes that happened for me um, with my hairstyle. Uh, maybe for you, you're in the same boat and you like changing your hair. Um, but wherever we're at with that, there's heaps of changes that happen in our life. I don't go into high school as well. I had uh, a lot of different changes in my friendship groups, uh, from who I was friends with when I was born and kind of your family friends, to then going to primary school and there's different friends there, and then into high school, where, as lots of you would know, friendship groups often change a lot. And then after school, where it's now my church friends that are actually my closest friends. There's been heaps of changes with that as well. Uh, likewise with jobs, I've had a whole bunch of different jobs over the years. I started off delivering pamphlets and kind of putting them in people's letterboxes. Then I stepped up in the world and started working at McDonald's. See, I work at Macca's. One. <laughs> Yes, come and see me after. That's fantastic. Uh, back is, and then, um, you know those people who try and get you to sign up and give money to different, uh, like, uh, what they call, like, not-for-profits on the side of the street in the city? That was me for a while, where I had to try and stop people and, like, convince them to give money every month to a particular charity. That one really sucked, um, so don't recommend that. And then I, um, then I decided that I wanted to go into business and so I was doing that for a while before I kind of reached the pinnacle of all employment and that's being a youth pastor. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For better or worse, um, I've had lots of changes in my life and um, I'm sure that you guys have too. I'm sure that you've had lots of changes and there's lots of changes that are going to happen in your life as well. Now some of us like change and some of us hate change. But the reality is that change always happens in our life. Things are always changing. And most of the time, we actually have some kind of say over whether that change happens or how we feel about that change. But we have a say over how it plays out. You can cut your hair or not. You can be friends with certain people or not. You can take a job or not take the job. We often have a choice. Now, there's not many things in life that are actually impossible to change, that are just set, and there's no chance that it will ever be any different. There's not many things that I could think of. But this passage actually raises probably the only thing that is impossible to change for you and I. 
It's a change that no one could ever possibly make on their own. There's no way to reverse it by yourself. You don't even, you don't even really have a say in the matter. It's just set for you. And it's pretty heavy, to be honest. And it, it's death. Now, I know that's not on the top of your list to be talking about on a Monday morning on summer camp. Welcome. Um, but this is something that the Apostle Paul actually raises for us in this book of Ephesians. And so we want to try and tackle it together. Because what he's saying here is that on your own, you are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Because every person in this room has sinned, and there's no way that we can reverse that on our own. We are all spiritually dead. And you can't change it. It's done. It's finished. And um, you might be sitting there and being like, oh yeah, I knew English at school. Maybe this is like a hyperbole. Did I get that right, man? Yeah, deliberate exaggeration. Yes. Um, maybe you're thinking that it's just exaggerating. But he's, he's not. He's not exaggerating. He's saying there's nothing you can do about it to change your situation. He says, there's someone else, though, that can. There's one other person who can change it for you. While you might not be able to do anything on your own, there is someone out there that can do something about this. And we can know it because he's actually made this impossible change come about before. He's done the impossible. But how do you change the impossible? And how can you make a change that just cannot be done? Death to life. But that's the question that I actually want us to, to think about today. How can this happen? How do you do the impossible and bring someone from spiritual death to spiritual life? Now, hopefully you all have Ephesians 2 still open in front of you. And we're going to start off at verse 1 by having a look at this together. And Paul starts by saying that in the past, for all Christians... Who are dead, and if we're not Christians, this is actually still the spot that we're all in. Have a look with me at, at verse 1. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. See, in those three verses, Paul is pointing out to us three different things that actually contribute to this spiritual state of being dead. The first one, you would have picked it up in verse 2, says it's when we followed the ways of this world when our lives and the things that we do just look like the rest of this world. When our identity is placed in the same things that everyone else puts them in that are ultimately just going to let us down. It's the first one. The second one is the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. And that's talking about the devil. That's talking about the devil there. And it's saying that he actually has some kind of say over this too. And he's at work in people trying to convince them that disobeying God and living how they want instead of how he wants is actually the right way to live. So we've got the world, we've got the devil, and we also have the flesh in verse 3. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Just simply doing whatever we want to do without thinking about anyone else or any implications of whatever we do. I don't know about you, but I can see each of those things at work in the past in my life. If we live following them at any point instead of following God, it says, just like everyone else, we're deserving of wrath from God. Because how could he possibly be okay with that? 
And if we heard last night that he's created the world and he's chosen people from before the creation of the world, how could he be okay with people just going, you know what, I just want to do what I want to do? He can't be okay with that. And you might be sitting there being like, Mitch, I am not spiritually dead. And I never have been. I'm not sinful. But I want to suggest that for each of us at one point in our lives, we've just kind of followed the bouncing ball of the ways of this world. That, that our life really hasn't been that much better or more unique or special than other people's when it comes to our sin. But we haven't always loved other people or loved God before ourselves. Because if we really think about it, all, all the problems that we kind of go, yeah, that's out there, like that's other people's problems or, or big problems that you hear about on the news with the world, I reckon most of those actually exist in each of our hearts as well. We can find most of those things in ourselves too. Most problems and issues with the world, they come from one common thing, and that's that people are selfish. They have themselves, number one. They live for themselves more than thinking about and caring for other people. And the reason is, you and I, we often just gratify the cravings of our own hearts, our own desires. We follow our heart rather than following what God says in here. We lie to make ourselves seem better than we are or to get out of situations that we don't want to be in. We love to make, we love to do things that make us. God knows that. It's going to be a slide that comes up behind me. And this is of a character named Dr. Eckelberg. He's from a book called The Great Gatsby, or a movie now as well. And um, I remember reading this in year 12. It was one of my required texts I had to read for the HSC. I think this was the only one I read because I was actually really <laughs> fascinated by it. And um, there's these two people, Wilson and Michael, and they're having this argument underneath this sign that looks over the whole town. And Michael's actually done something wrong by Wilson. And Wilson is trying to call him out on that. And he looks at him. And he glances up to Dr. Eckelberg watching down on them. And then he looks back at Michael and he says this. You may fool me, but you can't fool God. God sees everything. You may fool me, but you can't fool God. Because God sees everything. That's true. I'm not trying to have a stab at you this morning. But much of my life has actually looked the same as what I've just described. But that also doesn't make it okay. We're actually all in the same boat here on our own. We're all in the same boat. God is saying you're spiritually dead. But that instead of having this identity, we've all actually had this placed on our life instead. That's what defines us. And it's it's not changeable. We can't change it. We can't lift that label on our own. We can't reverse that. But in the next few verses, it's where we see the impossible change actually happen. We see this impossible change held out, not because of anything that we've done or anything that we actually can ever do. We see it's only through someone else. Have a look at me at verses 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2. Paul starts off verse 4 with but. And it's a beautiful word here because he's changing from going, 
you cannot do anything about this to offering us hope. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. Notice the one in those few verses that's actually taking the action and taking the initiative to do something about this spiritual state that all of us find ourselves in. It's God. It's not us making a move towards Him. It's God and Him actually showing His love towards us. It's the richness of His mercy. And it makes us alive with Christ, even though we were dead, and even though we've done nothing to actually change that. And I reckon this is actually held out in the Bible as the biggest possible change that could ever or will ever take place in everyone's life here in this room. The biggest change imaginable. Death to life. Like people who are dead physically, they don't come back to life. That can't change. And Paul is going, well, in the same way, you're spiritually dead and you can't do anything about that. But in Jesus, you can actually be made alive. It's a new identity. There is a new identity on offer and it's by God's grace. It's a gift that he gives you. And we're going to see in a moment what that looks like to actually be made alive in Christ. But I just want to drill down for a sec on what this word grace actually means. See, Paul, the guy writing this, he's saying that this has taken place for Christians. That already this change from spiritual death to spiritual life has already happened and it's by grace. And by grace alone. Follow me further down in verses 8 and 9. He fleshes this out more. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not by works, so that no one can boast. See, he's saying no one can just be a good enough person. No one can kind of tally up enough good religious deeds to earn their way into heaven. He's actually saying something far better and far more beautiful than that way of life could ever be. He's saying, you aren't going to stack up to my standards. You were dead. But I actually love you. I love you and I've saved you by graciously sending my son to die for you when that's what you deserved, not him. Saying you're not saved as a reward for your good deeds, your church ministry, your religious performance. You are saved by Jesus. By the grace that God has shown us in Him. What undeserved grace is that? Now that's, that's good news, isn't it? That's the best. God's grace and His love for you has been shown in Jesus and made you alive forever. You can't beat that. No amount of fun or other news that you ever hear this week or throughout your whole life is ever going to top that. I want to tell you a story just to try and help us to see this a little bit. The story um, it's about uh, two characters. Their names are Sydney and Charles. Now, Sydney and Charles... Um, they're from a book called A Tale of Two Cities, and the author, his name is Charles Dickens. Now, what I find really interesting is Charles Dickens has named one of these main characters after himself, Sidney and Charles. Okay, that's fairly unoriginal. Um, and Sidney and Charles, they're actually both kind of fighting over the same girl. They both like the same girl. And the thing that I find the most funny is, have a guess who wins? Who wins the girl? Charles, of course. It's like, yeah, write yourself into the book, and then you get the girl. Good on you, buddy. And um, so he gets the girl, and Sydney's left heartbroken, and he feels like Charles has wronged him because he's actually kind of gone behind his back and taken the girl. Her name's Lucy. And Charles and Lucy, they go off and they start living a nice life. They have a child together, and they're sort of like set up for living happily ever after. 
But then, disaster strikes for them. It's actually found out that Charles has uh, been arrested in his home country of France, taken back there, because he's committed treason, crimes against his own country. And the penalty for that there is death. It's death. And he's meant to go under a guillotine or it come down and cut his head off. So they lock Charles up in prison, and Sydney, he hears about this. So Sydney decides to make his way from England over to France. And he befriends one of the people at the prison, the guy that has the locks to all the, or the keys to all the locks of all the cells. He makes friends with him and he convinces this guy with the locks to let him go in to Charles' cell one night. And Sydney's come in with a bunch of his friends. They grab Charles, they drug him to knock him out, and they kidnap him. They take him out of the cell, and Sydney stays there and closes the door behind him. See, Sydney happened to look a little bit like Charles. They'd been mistaken for each other before. And Sydney, he's got his friends to come with him to actually rescue Charles and take him away to safety. And so in the cell, he puts Charles' clothes on. And the next day, he's let out to die for Charles. And on his way out, there's a woman that realizes that it's not actually him. And she comes up and she whispers to him, Are you really going to die for him? Are you really going to die for him? says yes and for his wife and for his child and he walks out to die for a man that he should not be dying for he wronged him he wronged his country he dies for him See, Charles Dickens, he was a man that many people thought was an atheist. Because he actually hated organized religion in his day. But he loved grace. He loved grace. Because what he understood was that religion says, die working hard for your God. But grace actually says, your God died for you. Your God died for you. And so he named this character after himself to show that in real life, his life had been spared because Jesus had died for him when he did not deserve it. That Jesus' death on the cross means that he could actually be made alive forever with God. That we were so loved by God when we did not deserve it that he sent his son to die in our place. He was so merciful that he put our clothes on his body when he was born as a baby in a manger. He was so gracious that he was executed for us when he went to the cross. That he won salvation when he rose from the dead so that we might actually truly be alive and live with him forever rather than staying dead. You see, this story about Jesus... It's actually all of our stories. Just like Charles Dickens wrote himself into a tale of two cities, we are a part of this story that we're hearing about this week. We have written into it as well. That's to remind us that God has made an impossible change through Jesus. That we might actually go from being dead being alive by God's grace. This is mind-blowingly kind and merciful. If you 
don't believe in Jesus? What kind of change does that make to your life if that's true? See, that changes everything. It honestly changes everything. It changes your whole purpose in life. Changes your spiritual state from being dead to being alive. It brings you into a relationship with the God of the universe. It promises you hope beyond this life. Because the Son of God is willing to die when you should. <coughs> See, Charles' life after this was completely changed. After his encounter with grace, he went away changed. And ours should too. Because when we receive this grace, there has to be this death to life change that is evident in our lives. Because by grace, we're actually changed from death to life in Christ. You see, it's this reality of being marked as dead and yet appearing alive that marks the Christian life. And it's what Paul finishes off this passage with here. He says this in verse 10. Follow with me. He says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, just like we heard last night. He's picking up that same idea, and then he tells us why. He says, To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, it's after receiving this grace and going from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive, that then God calls our lives to look different, and not before. He's saying, just as I chose you from before creation, I created you in Jesus, and only in Him, to do good works, and I've already prepared them for each of you. For each of you here who actually knows Jesus, I've prepared them for you. They're already laid out. And right now in the present, you've gone from death to life by grace. How cool is that? That's so cool. That label of dead is taken off of us. And instead, it's replaced with this. We're made alive. We are made alive in Jesus. I want to finish with a quick few points of application before we pray. The first one is this. I want to be really clear that these good works that it's talking about here in verse 10, they are only ever a response to grace. Paul's written this in a specific order to actually show us that it's not a way of earning our salvation, it's not a way of getting into heaven or keeping ourselves in God's good books. It's actually a response to what Jesus has done for us. If you take your notes down, write this down. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's not opposed to us trying and actually doing things that are good and putting in 100% as we serve Jesus, it's opposed to earning. See, what Paul is saying here is that we can't earn our way into God's kingdom. It's only by grace. But if we truly understand that, we have to be changed. And so he's laid out things for us to do as a response to that. On the other hand as well, though, it's not going, oh, fancy that. I'm actually really good at sinning. And God, He's really good at forgiving people. So we're like a match made in heaven. So that means that I can just keep on sinning, and God is just going to keep on forgiving. Christianity is perfect. It's not like that. You see, God's job is not to forgive us. He's not obliged to forgive us. He was never under an obligation to send Jesus to save us. It's said in verse 3 that we were... We're actually deserving of His wrath. And instead of showing that, He showed us grace. 
See, grace, it's not, it's not permission for us to sin. What grace is, is it's actually it's the power and the strength to overcome sin in our life. Knowing that Christ laid down his life for every single one of our sins. If you're a Christian here this morning, I want to encourage and remind you that no matter what you've done, you remain in God's grace. They're never too far from Him, and neither are any of your friends. I want to encourage you to not write anyone off in your life as being too far from God or too bad for God's grace. Now invite the worst behaved kid in your class to youth. They need the gospel just as much as anyone else. Never write anyone off from God's grace. Because He can do the impossible. He can do what you don't think can happen. If you're here and you're not a Christian, or you've wandered from God, I want to encourage you to come back. Come back home. This is the change that you need. You desperately need it. You might think, I've sinned heaps. God is better at saving people than you are at sinning. He's better at saving people than you are at sinning. He's greater than you are. Because by grace, He actually changes us from death to life. I want to finish with one final verse. Some of the four in our memory verse from last year. It's from the final book of the Bible where when Jesus appears to John and he says this to him. He says, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death. Jesus has defeated death. And he's alive today. It's only in Him that we have the impossible identity change that we all need. That that label of dead is ripped off of us and replaced with made alive. Because He was dead. And now He's alive. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Jesus. Thank You that only in Him go from being dead to being alive. I just pray that uh, right now as we spend time uh, singing to you, as we spend time after that in our community groups, that every single person here on camp would actually be really struck by that, by the good news that we've just heard in your word, that no matter what we've done in our past, that your grace is bigger than that, that your grace is better than that. And that you've shown us that in Jesus' death for us. In Him taking the punishment and the place that we deserve to stand in. Father, you're so good and kind and merciful. And I just pray that you help each of us to see that today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Mm -hmm.